Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Uh, would you welcome back uh, Todd Wagner as he comes to minister to us? Todd. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. We're just going to read three or four verses there eventually. And, and as we do, I'm going, to, I'm going to take a chance here with you. I'm going to just share with you something that I have uh, absolutely no obligation to share because you could never know it. Now, these men might have noticed it on Monday or Tuesday when we were together. But even as a couple of years ago, uh, Janice, Janet Jackson had a wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl. I, in a way that I have never had before, had a bathroom malfunction at 1035 Central Standard Time, Tuesday in Dallas, Texas. And uh, it was right before I came in here to be with you guys this week. And I came walking in here, and I had all over the back of my leg what looked to be about a half liter of Coke that had been poured down there and wearing light pants. And uh, I did the best I could to kind of just, you know, get some... Uh, you know, other water in there and just kind of, you know, rub it all off and everything. And, and then I came up here and I sat next to Dr. Bailey in this chair. I sat down and it caught my pant leg and it ripped my pants. <laughs> and so from behind, it looked like uh, I was so scared I couldn't control myself. <laughs> and from the front, had I moved too much to the side, it looked like I couldn't dress myself. But I had this great barrier between you and I. And so you couldn't see who was really here. And what I want to do is I want to get rid of that barrier. And I want to tell you and challenge you that you've got to get rid of the barriers that keep people from being who you really are. They ask me what I want to title a message every day, and I'm going to tell them right now we're going to title this living in a Carolina state of mind. Because the state motto of North Carolina is Esse Quam Videri which means to be rather than to seem to be. And so much of who we are as men and women that want to represent Christ is we often feel a tremendous push to seem to be something that sometimes we are not. And it is a curse on our own life, and it is a curse to those that we lead and those that we serve. Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 said these great words, not that I have already obtained it or I have already become perfect, but I press on. And I think about just that one little line right there of Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, and I think about how many of us feel pressure as men and women who love Christ, want to represent Christ, call people to follow Christ, who want to say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And we think to do that, we have got to give the illusion that we are perfect, almost as if we're lifting ourselves up as the Messiah and the Savior. Now, none of us would ever want to do that doctrinally, but practically, when we live out our lives in a way that puts barriers between who we really are and what people are able to see, most people think that they have nothing to do in their relationship with us because everything seems so perfect. But we know better, don't we? You know, yesterday I, I talked about the dead church. And even in the deadest churches in our country, I believe that there's almost always some remnant of life. I challenge people that are in dead churches to have a plan to communicate truth to leadership and to be careful that they don't go on funding leadership that is not orthodox and that doesn't flesh out that orthodoxy in real Christian living, that doesn't endorse things that are inconsistent with Scripture. And I tell them, look, you've got to come up with a plan to communicate that to them and love them. But if there is a leadership that is committed to not honoring Jesus Christ and honoring his word, then you're staying there without real measurable results and strategies that are clear is endorsing that leadership and your money tithing towards that is in effect sustaining that which is not honoring to God. So stay there for a while with a plan and with clear communication. But when leadership says, hey, this is the way we're going to roll here, you have not covenanted with that church, you've covenanted with Jesus Christ. And as painful as it might be to leave friends behind, moving forward is to do that. And I see so many pastors who aren't in dead Orthodox churches, but who, as I said, have stopped calling their people to be what Christ wants them to be. And they cut a deal with their people. And the deal goes like this. Look, you come here and you validate who I am by your attendance. 
You give me enough money that I can keep the lights on and pay the staff and keep this thing going. And I then, in turn, will not ask too much of you. And then we'll both tell each other we're doing what God wants us to do. I am filling up buildings where people hear me talk about God, and you are coming where people who say they love God come. And yet we know better that God does not measure spirituality by where you sit certain hours of the week. God calls us to be conformed to the image of Christ. And he doesn't measure our success as leaders by how many people listen to us speak. I got to tell you, in a way that humbles me, there are individuals that I have a chance to communicate to every week in this community that are leaders in industry, in film, in arts, in business, but entrepreneurs out the wazoo. But I don't think the Lord's going to send me, Todd, I got to tell you something. Of all the guys in Dallas, Texas, that have started churches, that have had churches, in your generation, there was not another pastor that week after week attracted high-capacity individuals to sit and listen to them. Well done. I don't think I'm going to hear it. And so I cannot cut a deal with the people that are there. If I've got to grow Watermark down to 30 people again so we can grow it to 300 that walk with Christ or grow it down to three that walk with Christ, that's what we need to do. There will be no deal that is cut. And the other deal I'm not going to cut with my body is I'm never going to give them the illusion that their pastor is perfect. And many people want their pastor to be perfect. And many pastors want others to treat them like they're perfect. And it is death to both of them. If I had to hang a motto out in front of our church that wasn't corny and it was but true, it's just no perfect people allowed. And that includes me. Folks ask me a lot what my biggest challenge is. I think I shared this the last time I had the privilege to speak here one time. My greatest challenge at Watermark, you need to know this, of the four or 5,000 folks I get to minister on a weekly basis there, the greatest challenge I have at Watermark is Todd Wagner. And if I can shepherd Todd Wagner, if I can get Todd Wagner to, to walk with Christ, to humble himself, to decrease so Christ might increase, to stay focused in the word, to stay deeply embedded in community with other believers, to listen to Christ, to walk continually throughout the day with him, then everything else takes care of itself. But that is a full-time job for me. And it takes everything I have for me to stay focused on Christ and to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. I tell folks, just because I'm a pastor, I'm not going to let you make me somebody who's not a Christian, who struggles to follow after Christ. Paul said, Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on that I might lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing on, and I want people to know, I want you to follow me as I press on towards Christ. But I am a man like you who struggles with his flesh, that the world seeks to woo, that the enemy seeks to tempt. And if I don't live on my knees continually in a community of folks who will spur me on continually, I will lose my right to lead. One of my dearest friends in life and a man that has impacted me both personally and professionally is a buddy named Tom Nelson. And you've heard Tommy stand here and talk about how he struggled personally with this issue of depression and how he felt like he couldn't really share that and when he began to share that with other people he found folks come out of the woodwork and begin to say things like well I've struggled with that as well secretaries elders people in his body and when Tommy was just coming out of that I called him I knew he was getting uh, his legs back under him where he felt like he could have uh, an opportunity to serve publicly again I called him right there Uh, at the end of that fall about a year and a half ago and I said Tom listen I'm about to take my staff away and I want you to come and I want to talk with you I want to ask you some questions and I want you to share and so the very first time he spoke to really anybody was with our staff team and we all got together and Tommy started with our staff in much the same way and he said guys he said you know uh, I realize that you guys uh, have a lot in your life you can't talk about and especially if you're struggling with something like depression when you're supposed to be people of joy. And I said, Tommy, I said, I love you, man, but stop. I said, they absolutely can talk about it. And I said, gang, how many of y'all struggle with depression? And about 15 hands went up. And I go, Tommy, that's not new information. 
That's the way we live here. And he kind of looked around, looked at me, looked at them. And I said, how many of you guys struggle with the issue of pornography? How many of you struggle with body image? How many of you struggle with loving your wife? How many of you struggle with anger and control issues? And it wasn't people who were coming out of the closet. It's the way we live. It's authentic believers who struggle together to make Jesus more famous. I want you to meet my staff. Take three minutes. Now, these are my staff that have not personally chosen to go through some ministries that allow them to face some of the things that we all wrestle with, the hurts, habits, and hang-ups, to coin the phrase that's been used other places, that people struggle with in life. I told all my staff, there's about 80-some-odd folks on staff at Watermark right now, I said, if you've been through Celebrate Recovery, which is one of our recovery ministries, I said, I want you to leave. The rest of you, come here with me. And even as we live continually together, I want you just to share. And this weekend, I'm going to talk about authenticity with our body. I want you to look them in the camera, and I want you to tell them where you every day cling to Jesus, lest you struggle and fall away. Meet my staff. Watch this. Hey, I'm Abby Shelby, and I am a follower of Christ that struggles with people pleasing in the approval of man. Hi, I'm Bob Rudy. I'm a believer who continues to battle with giving and receiving unconditional love. Hi, my name is Bron Brown. I'm a follower of Christ who struggles with fear and anger. Hi, my name is Todd Wagner, and I love Jesus, but I also love me. Because of that, I mess with the anger and lust and control issues that a lot of people struggle with, but I also hurt deeply people that I love a lot. My name's David Peniel, and I like to be in control, and I get really anxious when I face things I can't handle alone. I'm Linda, and I struggle with understanding and accepting God's grace that it truly reaches me where I am. My name is Gary Stroop, and performance and control have ruled my life for a lot of years, and because of Christ, I'm beginning to experience a lot of freedom. My name is Danny. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who just struggles, especially loving Christ daily. But God, who's rich in mercy, allows me to make it through every day. Hi, my name is Erin Shipley, and I struggle with control, which shows itself in my fear of the unknown. Hey, I'm Rob Berry, and I struggle with detachment. I really feel like the Lord has been redeeming my mind from past sexual images. Hi, I'm Melissa, and even though I know God chose me, I often struggle with believing I'm lovable. Uh, my name is Jim, and I struggle with anger. And uh, when I rely on the Lord, he helps me keep it under control, which is most of the time. My name is Patrick, and I am currently struggling through anxiety and depression. Hi, I'm Scott Miller, and I'm a believer who wrestles with perfectionism and the impact that has on my family. Hi, I'm Kim Lanier, and I'm a believer who struggles with pride and control, which has caused some recent anxiety. My name is Josh Carr, and I'm a believer that struggles with self-doubt. And I struggle with contentment and body image. And I struggle with pride, which shows itself in just passivity in my marriage. It's wrestling with God for what he believes is best for me. Control. My deep-seated struggle with pride. Controlled by food. The issues of anger and self-control. Laziness. Lust, depression, and doubt. An addiction to pornography and pride. Selfishness. Just wanting the things of this world. Control. Trusting God. Anger. People pleasing and control. Fear and insecurity. Lust and selfishness. Self-condemnation of guilt and with shame. Finding my identity and, and the things I do work, and so that kind of develops into workaholism. I struggle with pride, procrastination, purity, and people pleasing. Hi, I'm Ryan Howell, and I'm a control freak that struggles with pride, but have found peace by experiencing the grace offered by Jesus Christ. I'm Veronica Netzer, and the Lord's really been working in my life in the area of forgiveness and just really realizing how vital it is in my walk with Him to forgive past hurts. Well, that was unscripted. We were just after one of our staff meetings. I said, come on. I set a camera up, and one after one, we just walked up there. I said, I want one sentence. Where, where's your flesh vulnerable? Where if the Spirit of God is not active in your life every day? Or are you going to move away from Christ and the life that you love? You know, we shared that uh, the following Sunday and talked a lot about how we are not a perfect church. We're not a perfect staff. We're not a perfect people. We do have a perfect Savior. We've got a perfect mission. We want to invite you into it. You know, what I really will tell you about that staff team right there is my impression of them is a lot like the impression that others had of men like Peter and John on the day of Pentecost and shortly after that when they watched these guys. They lived their life with such power and authority and, and they, they were confused by them. They observed, it says, the confidence of Peter and John. 
And they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were unrefined fishermen. And yet they recognized that these uneducated, unrefined, untrained, imperfect men were speaking with perfect peace, were living lives of perfect purpose, were speaking perfect truth. And they go, how could it be? And the answer was it because we've learned to overcome the deficiencies of this world through education, formalism, and just giving off an illusion that our lives are together, it's because they recognize that they are men that had been with Jesus. And that's who we are. We are people that at any moment will embarrass Christ and destroy ourselves and discourage others when we stop clinging to Christ. One of the things that happens when you get in a position of leadership is it isolates you, and it makes you believe that you've got to give off an aroma that your life isn't filled with the same struggles it was always filled with. One of the things I tell my kids, who like every kid, and too many of us are just awestruck by celebrity and filled with a sense of awe at those that are splashed on media screens. You know, Paris Hilton was in Highland Park Village a couple of nights ago, and they're all buzzing about friends that were up there with pictures taken with Paris Hilton. Somebody touched her arm. And my kids know that just the way that my life was weaved and different things along the way that many guys that are successful in the professional sports arena are friends of mine and folks that have been to the height of Hollywood fame. Brad Pitt was a friend of mine in college. Cheryl Crow and I spent time together in college and they've met some of these people and we've done things together and they realize these are just people. But Hollywood wants you to believe that these aren't people. These are people that have risen above the fray and live these glamorous lives. I want to tell you something. They live anything but glamorous lives. They're isolated, lonely, broken people. Most of them, many of them who don't know Christ. Guess who is teaching messages around the country today? Guess who's getting trained to lead churches around the country today? People who desperately need a Savior. Broken people. Do you remember who David drew to himself? 1 Samuel 22. It says that they were... People who were in distress, people who were in debt, people who were discontented. But they had found a leader that they could find hope in. And we all know that David's a type of Christ. And yet somehow along the way, we move Christ out and we start to try and present ourselves as the people who have arrived. Now, I want to tell you what has happened. When you live with this Jesus, as Peter and John did, your life does change. And there is a skill to it. It's what the word wisdom means. And that word wisdom that is used in Proverbs is the word that was used for skilled craftsmen to build temples, skilled counselors to give advice, skilled musicians to sing, to play instruments, and skilled livers, people who live life well. But we live life well because we keep depending on Jesus, not because we have graduated to a plane where we don't need Jesus anymore. Can I tell you three questions that people want to know when they come in contact with you, the church of Jesus Christ? What they're longing for is people who are going to love them with a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. But they come to you and they look at you and they're going to want to know, you know, do you love me? Do you really love me? I'm a complicated person. My life isn't pretty. I've had people tell me before, who smoke. So, you know, all kinds of folks want my butts in their church. They just don't want my butts outside their buildings. And so I feel like I've got to quit smoking and get my life together before I can go to those places. Are you going to really love me? There is a lot of pain here. And I've got to have the freedom to be who I am because I don't have the freedom to be who I am that I can't deal with where I'm at. So I can't get to where I want to be. I love the saying that one man said a long time ago in a very creative way, you got to be who you is because if you ain't who you is, then you is who you ain't. And if you is who you ain't, you can't ever deal with who you are in a way that God can work redemptively. And are you going to love people the way they are? You know, I had a, a, a moment with my daughter. We were out and getting Jamba Juice. And um, the lady in front of me was, was scrambling to pay for her little drink. And uh, she gave a debit card. The debit card was empty. And uh, she goes, oh. She goes, well, my spouse must have taken my credit card because this isn't even mine. And I see why now she took my debit card. And I noticed the pronouns that were used there. 
But nonetheless, I just said, hey, listen, you know, could, could you, uh, I said, just, just, if you don't mind, I mean, I'll pay for that. I'm happy to pay for that. You know, just because I've left my wallet at home before. She goes, you do that? I go, yeah. And she goes, look, at, I work at Bank of America. If you ever need anything, oh, just come here. I'll take care of you. I go, well, I'm happy with my banker, but thank you very much. It's not that big a deal. I'm just happy to make your day. I said, you know what? You want to thank me? Here's a way to thank me. And I just gave her a little deal I carry in my pocket, which is a trifold that tells her I hang around with a bunch of people that love Jesus and just say, come hang out with us sometime. I'd love to invite you to meet some of my friends and uh, let you know what has radically changed our lives. And she goes, thank you. I will do that. Thank you so much. And so, uh, you know, she lingered in the store a little bit. My, my daughter and I got our drinks. And we walked out. We were sitting in our car and we were backing up, okay? And we're pulling out. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on my daughter's window. And I saw it was this nice lady. And I put the window down. And uh, she goes, hey, let me ask you a question. She goes, uh, this church. She goes, what do you think about same-sex marriages? And I said, well... You know, she goes, are you okay with them, were her exact words. And I said, well, it, it, I go, that's a great question. It depends on what you mean by okay with them. If you mean, uh, does it freak us out or scare us? Absolutely not. I mean, listen, people all around this world struggle with all kinds of different things. Some people struggle in the uh, area of sexual purity. Some people uh, make choices in a homosexual way. I go, I happen to be a heterosexual pervert. And uh, I go, but, you know, we're not okay with me destroying my life through my heterosexual choices. I said, but if you mean, do we love people who struggle with homosexual issues in their life? Absolutely. And she took the card and she flinged it back at me. And she says, I don't think it's a struggle. I think it's a blessing. And, uh, you know, I just said, hey, listen, I understand. But just know this, that God loves you. And so do I. And I'm so glad we got to meet today. And she walked to her car. And we backed up. And my little girl was a freshman. She goes, that was awkward. (laughs) And I said, what, the part about your dad being a heterosexual pervert? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, but, but the other thing too. And so we had a great conversation on the way to school about struggles and how God loves us enough not just to let us be given over to our desires and how I face my struggles with deep dependence on Jesus and being in touch with the frailty of my flesh. And we talked about her struggles and how Jesus can intervene there. You know, people want to know, do you love me? I mean, I am so humbled. Some of those stories I was going to share with you on Tuesday when we were together were stories of people that just said, I found freedom here. And you name the addiction, they found freedom from it. You name the, the you know, worldly strategy to cope, and they found freedom from it, not at Watermark, in Christ. Because they found other people who are willing to say, Let me tell you what Jesus did in my life and is doing day by day. And apart from him, we can do nothing. They want to know if you love him. They also want to know if if you're real. And that's why it's so important that you share. Like I tell people all the time, you know, I'm going to share with you where I'm at in my walk with Christ. Now, because I've walked with Christ for a while and because one of the privileges of my job is I see the devastation of sin on a continual basis. I've experienced personally in the past and it threw me into the arms of Jesus, and I've never left there by his good grace in a way that is spectacular enough to make people feel like I don't really love him. But I want to tell you, every day I have that temptation and opportunity, and I am well aware of where this man could go if Christ didn't hold me and I didn't seek him. And I, I, I want folks to know that. I don't want them to think that I've arrived. One of the things that's so dangerous about getting a degree is you think you're done learning. Oh, please don't make that mistake. One of the things that's dangerous about getting a job where you're leader, leading is you forget that you've always got to follow. And uh, this little deal I came across a while ago it was on MSNBC a while back, and I'm going to show you. You may not recognize this gal. You certainly wouldn't recognize her husband. This, this, this guy used to be married to Solomon Rushdie. Remember him? Okay, just woof off the face of the earth, but somehow bumped into this beauty, uh, Padma Rusky, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Lakshmi, I'm sorry. Now, she's an award-winning chef as well and was a model, but what you see about Padma right there is on her arm. It's kind of tough with the glare. It's a scar right there on her arm. It's a beautiful young gal, but, but that scar came when she was a young girl in a very serious accident that marred her right hand and left this uh, deep, deep scar, broke her pelvis, 14 of her uh, bones, 
And, and she had to punch herself through a windshield to get free from the car wreck, and it left this devastating scar on her arm. And, and she would go through her life wearing long sleeve shirts and covering up her arm, and then she got into modeling one day. Somebody said, would you come model for us? And they noticed every picture she took, she took like this, or she took like this. And finally they said, man, what, you know, just turn. And they saw the scar. And what happened is that scar set her apart from every other model. In fact, she was one of the most sought-after models of her day because designers and photographers were drawn to her uniqueness. It said men loved her because she was fleshy and rugged and a human to them, and women responded to her when she showed her scar because it showed that she was flawed and not everything was perfect with her. And the very thing that she thought would ruin her beauty is what drew people to her, her brokenness. And the peace that she had come to with her brokenness. What's that sound like? See, as a leader, if you're not somebody who tells folks that you've come to peace with your brokenness, and you've got away from trying to be an impressive individual and realize that no matter how impressive the world thinks you are, you realize in light of a holy God, there's nothing impressive about you. And then you begin to see who you really were in light of perfection, not in light of the world standard. And the more you looked at Christ, the more you were aware of your sin and the depth of your heart. And not just what was exposed out there, but the inner thoughts and attitudes that corrupted your life. Even if you were a person who was spared from outward actions that were destructive, it draws people to you when you're real. And then folks want to know, do you love me? Are you real? Are you who you appear to be? And really they want to know, does it work? And the it is, does a relationship with Jesus Christ really bring redemption into your life? And that's why we tell stories. And that's why we aren't proud of our sin, but we're not afraid to say where we've come from. Can you imagine men being around Jesus? And Jesus said, now look it. I don't ever want you to tell somebody that you used to be a prostitute. You don't ever tell somebody that you used to beat women. You don't ever tell somebody that you looked at pornography. You don't ever tell somebody that you used to have a vile mouth and an anger problem. Don't you ever tell somebody that you were a tax collector that stole from people. Are you kidding me? It's his story of redemption. And you are to tell people, look, I'm not proud of this, but here's my story. It's his story. And we're to give testimony to what Christ has done and is doing. Do you know what Christ has done? He has saved me from a life that is a slave to self. Do you know what Christ is doing? Day by day, he's holding me and showing me the glory of his will and way so that I stay there and in light of him the pleasures of the world that are still very attractive are not at all attractive compared to the truth and the freedom that comes in Christ that's my story now listen if your story and I want to tell you one of the most powerful stories that can be told out there today is from an early age you were raised in a home of grace from an early age you come to understand who Christ is from an early age you begin to walk in his way and because of that there is a freedom in your life And there are a lack of scars that you take no credit for. But you look them in the eye and say, let me tell you my story. When hormones hit me, by the grace of God, I'd already been hit by a more powerful spirit than the spirit of desire. And it controlled me and kept me from giving myself in a way that was destructive. And I wanted to, but I wanted Jesus more because I knew he was good. And he showed me where the good candy was. And I stopped grabbing atomic fireballs. And the times that I did, he reminded me from things that I'd hid in my word. And I put them back and I always got the bag of Skittles. You tell him that story, to use the illustration from the other day. And people are going to go, you mean to tell me from your earliest age, your dad showed you where the good stuff was? What a story. My daddy wouldn't like that. He said, but let me just tell you about my daddy. He loves you. There is no probationary period with him. Come and find forgiveness. Listen to what it says. Two places I want to read with you in Scripture right now, and then we'll end. One is just a very familiar one in Matthew chapter 11, where it says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, verse 29. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come and you'll find rest here. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You're going to have a yoke on you. It's the yoke of self, the yoke of the world, the yoke of pleasure. And that yoke, while it's got a thin layer of sweetness, has a burning aftertaste that you want to spit out, and sometimes it gets stuck in your jaws. But you put this yoke on you and you're going to love it. Now, when you come to him and you find rest for your souls, this is what David experienced in Psalm 32. And I want you to turn there with me. I'm going to read eight verses with you. And I want to communicate to you this morning because just like some people behind barriers like this that have had bathroom malfunction and are a mess from behind and got holes in the front, they hide behind this because they want to stand here. 
But sooner or later, people are going to be behind you and beside you, and you're going to be exposed for what you are, and it's going to ruin your life and the ministry. And you've got to come out from behind you and say, look, man, can somebody help me figure this thing out? Can somebody sew this up and show me how to get this right? Because I want to communicate, and I don't want to have to hide. I love the way Psalm 32 starts. How blessed. That word blessed is the same word that is used in Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is on the law of the Lord. And on that law he meditates day and night. How blessed, how full of life is the man who walks in the righteous way. David has not been walking in the righteous way. This psalm is written undoubtedly right after he had confessed through the conviction of the prophet Nathan about his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah. Psalm 51 was one psalm, and here's another one as he looks back. Now that he's been freed, he said, I am like that man that was in Psalm 1, that walked not with the wicked, that sat not with the sinner, that did not hang around scoffers, and I was blessed then. And now when I made decisions, I was dying, I've come back to Christ, and he has done what he said that he would do. Of course, David didn't say Christ. Come back to God and he has given rest to my soul. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And that doesn't mean out of view of others. It means atoned for. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Listen to this. Because I know that there are Davids out there right now that haven't yet had a Nathan who's by the grace of God, seen something in their life who's spoken truth to them or who hasn't had the courage to walk forward without Nathan himself. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. My iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are, not, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Do you see what he says right here? Do you want to come out of the withering heat of self-protectionism and deceit and veiled perfection? There's life there. You wonder why there's no joy in your life, that that blessed life that Christ talks about isn't there. It's because you're hiding behind the pulpit. What you think people want you to be. Do you know what people want you to be? People who know you need a Savior. People who are experiencing the freedom of the Savior and the forgiveness of the Savior. And if it means you lose a season of leadership to reconnect with a leader who can give you life, lose it. There is life there. Come. Some of you don't want to deal with things because you think it'll affect your career. I'm here to tell you, if you don't deal with them things, you won't have a career. And Jesus wants to be made famous through you. Come to him. Come to each other. Confess your sins. And let him heal you. Father, I pray for the student body that I know wants to honor you, and it is just so difficult when we think nobody else struggles like we struggle to have to tell somebody, look them in the eye and say, I've got a real anger problem. I'm not sure I can build a congregation because I'm not sure my wife will attend my church. I'm not sure I'd want to attend my church because I know what I meditate on, and it's not always Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Father, I can't tell themselves to clothe themselves in Christ because I'm a young gal that isn't even comfortable in the flesh that you've clothed me with. Father, I pray that people out here whose bodies are withering in the heat of isolation and withering in the heat of, um, of just the deception of, uh, of acting like things are well with our soul when they're not, that they would just believe that there are people here who by the grace of God have been made like Jesus who can handle their sin, who can go with them in weeping to the Savior, who can begin to rebuild in their life a confidence that will make them the men and women that you want them to be, who always struggle with sin but who struggle victorious so that we can look others in the eye and say we can identify with the strong pulls of this world. I have been tempted in every way as you have been, and yet now by the grace of God, increasingly without sin, as I've learned to take the way of escape that he has provided for me. But I can't do it alone. 
and there was a day when I didn't. And let me tell you how I met Christ. Father, I pray that those of us who already know you would enjoy the benefit of our knowing and that we would invite others to know us for who we are today so that we might then be who you want us to be. I thank you, Christ, that you want to bless us. May we find blessing in being obedient to your way of coming. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week. See you.